Hello, uh, welcome. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel, uh, and our program is part of the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy. We're glad you joined us for today's version of Digital Slide Review and Sign Out. Um, the program that we're going to talk about today has to do with uh, GI pathology and uh, revolves around a very interesting case that uh, arose recently. Uh, it was a uh, middle-aged gentleman in his 40s who uh, had developed a bit of jaundice and uh, hyperbilirubinemia. Um, and uh, that, of course, uh, makes you think about possible neoplasia, possible stone, possible stricture, various other causes that could lead to uh, obstruction in the uh, bil biliary tree. Um, so he underwent endoscopy, and uh, this is a representative view of what was uh, greeting the endoscopist as he entered the uh, uh, second portion of the duodenum and began to look for the uh, duodenal, uh, excuse me, began to look for the ampulla, uh, or a rather bulky, sort of fungating appearing mass, a variable vascular pattern, um, sort of a differing uh, pattern of architecture. So uh, this was uh, biopsied and uh, found to have uh, adenobitous epithelium. Uh, because of its size and so forth, the patient underwent um, uh, uh, later resection. But uh, the kind of neoplasia that we may encounter in this location that uh, induce jaundice uh, is uh, valuable to review. This is a nice differential for medical students to be aware of, things that can cause elevated bilirubin, obstructive jaundice, and so forth. Uh, of course, uh, adenomas at the ampulla, uh, of course, are uh, fairly frequently encountered and uh, can cause uh, obstruction. Likewise, uh, carcinomas uh, of the pancreas, biliary tree, and so forth uh, can uh, do the same. Uh, and these can have several histo histologic types. They can be more con conventional ductal type, uh, pan pancreatic ductal or more biliary type. They can be cystic lesions with uh, uh, varying degrees of dysplasia, including very little or no dysplasia. And then, of course, they can be more enteric type of adenocarcinomas that you might see elsewhere. We also see other tumors that can cause obstructive jaundice, neuroendocrine tumors, though more frequent in the tail of the pancreas, do occur in the in the head and the body. Uh, likewise, uh, serous neoplasms, usually benign, can occasionally uh, induce obstructive uh, symptoms. Solid pseudopapillary tumor, again, more frequently encountered in the uh, body of the pancreas than in the head, uh, but uh, conceivably could cause that. And in this age group, in the mid-40s, those would be not uh, infrequent. And then we get into the less frequently encountered disorders like uh, you know, pseudotumors, the autoimmune IgG4-related uh, uh, pancreatitis, uh, and then less frequently encountered neoplasms like lymphomas or solitary fibrous tumors, uh, primitive neuroectodermal tumors, uh, Wilms tumor, et cetera, et cetera, metastatic tumors, and those sorts of things uh, begin to enter into the differential as well. So uh, I mentioned the biopsy was done showing adenomatous epithelium, and we can look here at the resection specimen. Uh, as you can see from low magnification, we have a nice uh, section of uh, duodenal wall here, normal mucosa on the surface here, pancreas here, pancreatic duct here, uh, and then we see this uh, neoplasm here. Um, and uh, you can see that there are varying degrees of uh, uh, seeming invasiveness, but here we see some of the ampullary uh, tissues. And here we can see down growing into the duct a little bit of hyperchromatic uh, epithelium, uh, as you can see here. Um, and even this uh, epithelium here looks to be still uh, within the uh, sort of in situ uh, level. It doesn't have a uh, high grade dysplasia. It's clearly adenomatous, crowded uh, uh, epithelium here. So we have evidence of adenomatous type epithelium extending into the ampullary duct here. Um, and as we look at the surrounding tissues, I think you'll see that uh, here um, we have, uh, again, same sort of uh, adenomatous epithelium. Here's some benign epithelium um, and varying degrees of it here uh, associated with uh, the uh, uh, loss of uh, normal enteric uh, functionalities here. Uh, and we get quite a ways over here before we get back to a more 
uh, normal appearing uh, uh, enteric epithelium uh, with uh, villi and so forth. So you can see, you'll see here, degrees of surface dysplasia with uh, crowding, loss of goblet cells and so forth, still over here well into uh, the uh, near the margin here. Coming back to low magnification, we'll go and take a look at that more solid and potentially uh, invasive area here where we see it, it seems to have a little bit of a downward projection. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, there is uh, the beginnings of uh, involvement of the uh, <clears throat> muscularis by uh, tissue that is uh, more confluent, has necrosis here, more complex uh, tissue. So we're beginning to develop a, uh, an invasive adenocarcinoma. Um, and here you can see uh, that it's uh, just beginning to invade the wall. So uh, this then uh, begins to put us into the staging of this lesion as a carcinoma rather than as purely an adenoma. Uh, and uh, deriving from an adenoma, this, is, this would be an enteric type of uh, tumor. Uh, and here you can see the difference here between uh, the more solid and complex cribriform glands. Uh, certainly, if you were to get this, you would think of high-grade dysplasia or invasive carcinoma. Um, and here, we're sort of undermining um, the, a degree of the uh, normal uh, duodenal mucosa. So uh, we've got some lateral spread uh, from the lesion, at least undermining uh, otherwise benign uh, duodenal mucosa and extending upwards here to the surface in a few foci. So um, I think a nice illustration of this with a very nice section, which you should probably come back and examine for yourself to see the contrast between the adenoma involving the ampulla, uh, as well as the developed area of uh, carcinoma uh, that's involved with this. So, um, one might ask, well, could this uh, lesion have been handled more conservatively? Um, and uh, I think this case nicely illustrates some of the challenges with that. Well, certainly uh, a, a endoscopic resection might have been able to, uh, you know, conceivably loop off this much of the, of the ampulla. It would have been somewhat uh, challenging uh, for that degree of surgery. So uh, unlikely that an endoscopic surgery could have uh, completely eliminated this uh, lesion, um, but certainly could have uh, done much to, uh, to make it perhaps less uh, serious and might have been able to do something like this. Uh, but I think leaving behind this residua in the duct is uh, one of the challenges for endoscopic surgery in this location. So uh, thinking of tubular adenomas in the ampulla, this is the precursor lesion, and obviously we have ampullary adenocarcinoma. These are very frequently associated with the familial polyposis syndrome, familial adenomatous polyposis, um, and oftentimes can be asymptomatic for very long periods. Uh, early detection, of course, if we recognize that the person is at risk or has this disorder in their family background or their personal background, then they're going to undergo surveillance to detect any uh, development of, of serious lesion. And that would allow uh, more conventional endoscopic removal or endoscopic mucosal uh, surgery to uh, remove the lesions. And the symptoms that we get relative to this site, of course, are those of pancreatic duct obstruction or biliary duct obstruction, which can lead to impaired digestion, maybe nausea, vomiting, maybe pain uh, if there's associated pancreatitis due to obstruction. And of course, follow-up if it's purely an adenoma would involve endoscopic ultrasound, CT, and MRI. So um, <clears throat> looking at that uh, process, the decision tree with this is somewhat uh, uh, important to consider because uh, obviously you, you're going to try to get a biopsy so you know what you're dealing with. Um, and if it's purely an adenoma, then you begin to ask the question of, you know, what are the, what are the other parameters that might steer me towards more uh, invasive surgery or more staging studies? So if it's a larger lesion, larger than a sonometer, or has any degree of high-grade dysplasia, or clinical ulceration or irregularity of the margins, those are things that should lead you to uh, getting staging, maybe ultrasound, CT, and so forth. 
uh, at which point you can then make a decision to go to either uh, endoscopic resection or surgery uh, or potentially even palliation if it's uh, spread to, to nodes. Now, if the biopsy returns ampullary adenocarcinoma, then you're going to go right away to staging uh, studies with CT, ultrasound, PET, and so forth, um, and then either go to uh, surgery or palliative therapy um, because uh, it's unlikely that you're going to, at that stage, uh, opt for endoscopic surgery. So I uh, hope that's helpful in understanding some of the uh, uh, options that are out there. Um, if we have none of the high-grade uh, features, you know, no worrisome features, then you might uh, consider uh, leaving that patient at surveillance uh, after you've resected. Um, and especially if it's uh, sort of an early stage or they have familial adenomatous polyposis, they've only got so much bowel to deal with and you don't want to compromise them too early. Uh, so th those considerations come into play in that stage as well. So I uh, hope you enjoyed this case, final diagnosis, tubular adenoma that involving the ampulovator and vader with uh, a development of adenocarcinoma. And of course, in this, uh, we would use the ampullary staging system, the uh, ampullary checklist from the CAP to uh, provide the checklist data rather than the pancreatic uh, checklist. Well, I hope you enjoyed this uh, case and that uh, you'll uh, uh, give us a like. Uh, certainly, uh, we include the digital slides in the comments uh, about the video so that you can come and study those at your uh, leisure. Uh, there is value in that uh, process as well. So uh, until next time, uh, thanks so much for joining me.